My name is Dor was Dorothy Patrick originally, and then Dorothy Pennell, and now it's Dorothy McComas. And I was born February the 25th of 1929 in Blanco, New Mexico. That's a little bitty town right outside of, of Bloomington and Aztec. I, but they moved back to Arkansas, and I went to started school here at Cane Hill. And they moved back to Texas, so I went to Texas school for a while. And it was a great big school and so many kids and such a huge place, it was quite different. And then after a few years, they moved back. I think when I was in the fifth grade, they moved back to Arkansas. And I came to Cane Hill School. Much different, but I, of course at first I didn't like it, but I learned to love it. It was a good school, well run. We had Kate Finley for our superintendent, and she was a dandy. She did a good job. We had upstairs in the big auditorium room, we had a lot of classes and would take turns in there, and Miss Finley would keep study hall for the ones that wasn't in class. And <clears throat> we had wood, I mean, coal burning stoves, great old big thing in the corner, and it was really, it'd warm it up. And we'd go down to the spring to get water, to get a drink. And the way I remember it, <clears throat> somebody, two girls or two boys would get to go down and get a bucket of water and bring it up there, and I think we all used the same dipper, as well I remember it. But they were they gave us a good education. We studied, studied hard, and we had to do our work, and we did. And it was a good good school, good atmosphere, and lots of fun. I can remember lots of fun that we had. And I was the, the first girl or child in the whole school to get glasses. And that was took a little teasing to get used to that. But the teacher said, now, Dorothy, whatever you do, don't you let them make you cry. I think I was in the seventh or eighth grade by then. And I also was the first one in Cane Hill School to have a job. And the boys were all pretty envious because they couldn't find one. But I was, I sat with the switchboard when I was in probably the eighth grade, just a little kid. And I sat there and helped Alta Robinson so she could get her dinner and do her work. And I'd stay all week and all weekend and go home every other weekend. And I'd get pretty homesick, but I was I was famous for that, for having a job. And it didn't pay much, but back then times were pretty hard, and a little bit of money went a long ways. Are you kidding? Of course we listened. <laughs> we knew all the gossip. <laughs> yes, we listened. To me, it wasn't as interesting probably as being a kid, but I'd listen, and you'd pull, it'd ring, and you'd pull one of these brass things, it was about three inches long, and you'd plug it, you'd say, hello, this is Cane, Cane Hill operator, who did you want? And they'd tell you what line they wanted, and you'd pull up another one and plug them together so they could talk to each other. And somehow, I don't remember, a light went off or something when they were finished their conversation. I didn't listen all the time. They'd get another call and you'd have to answer it. And long distance was pretty complicated. You'd have to know whether to go through the Tulsa or which way to go to get them to the right one. And I'd sit there and I enjoyed it. It was, and then when she got her work done, I'd go, I had a room upstairs at Alta and Joe Robinson's house. And I'd go up and do my homework. You know, to me, it wasn't that interesting. Gossip wasn't. <laughs> Kids didn't talk much. You used the telephone when it was something you had to tell somebody. It wasn't just you'd talk to your friends for 30 minutes every evening. Kids didn't abuse, abuse the privilege of using the phone. If some of my schoolmates called, I probably listened every time. <laughs> but mostly I remember getting that call to go to somebody sick and call in the doctor and 
real serious things. It wasn't as fun. The telephone wasn't then. They'd call and say somebody's having a baby, and that would be interesting to tell that. It was in her living room, the switchboard was. And before that, it was in that red brick building that they're reconstructing now. We call it, it was a Pyatt lived there at one time. I don't know what they call that house, but it was just very small. It was, but now they have had a, people digging around and they found that that house used to be 30 foot longer than it is now. Did you know that? So it used to be like when they used it in the Civil War for their headquarters. It was bigger. It wasn't just that little. It just looked like one room now. But the the switchboard had been there for a lot of years before Alta Robinson took it. For basketball, we had a dirt court. It was very smooth and level, and before a game, they'd put fresh chalk. I remember those ball games were pretty special. We'd get out of class and go sit up under those walnut trees and watch them play. I got to play. I was a basketball player, not a very good one because I was kind of small, a little bit short, but it was fun. We'd meet kids from other schools that way, and and then occasionally, we'd, well, for the tournament, the way I remember it, we went to Greenland. They had a gym, a big gym, and to us it was huge after playing on a dirt court. But it was a good good time to go to school. Every, everybody was poor. We were all in the same boat, most of us, but we didn't know it. We thought we were well off and happy. <laughs> we were glad to go to school. It was a fun thing to me to go to school. We had games we'd play outside, <clears throat> like softball. I love softball. And I excelled in that because I could run really fast. I was a real fast runner. And when we went back for school reunion, <clears throat> the first time we had one, the boy said, well, I remember her. She's the one that beat us running. <laughs> we'd play ball, we'd play hopscotch, we'd play jump the rope was a favorite thing for us girl, well, boys too. And there was a ridge of rocks around the building that just stuck out about four inches. And we would walk that and it was like three or four foot off the ground and it was a no-no, you weren't supposed to do that. And the teacher would catch us because those rough bricks would pull little snags on our sweater. And the teacher and mother would know we'd been walking the wall. And that was fun to do. And the kids would fall off of it, but we never did have one hurt. Real bad, a few scrapes. My dad was Herb, well, Patrick. And mother was Cornea Elizabeth. And they were, dad was born in Texas and mom was born here in Cane Hill. So I was the oldest of five. I was the big girl. And my parents raised, they were some of the first ones to start raising chickens. <clears throat> so we did better after that. We had <clears throat> a lot of chicken to eat and that was good. We milked cows and had a big garden. Had a good life. And being the oldest one, I got to go help milk the cows. And I could do that. I helped dad milk. Sometimes we milk quite a few, three or four, no more than that. Yeah, and just with your hands. And a lot of the years we just had enough, one cow for the family use. We'd gather the eggs and work in the garden and whatever needed to be done. We uh, The kids pitch in and help, learn to cook and can and clean house sew and things that people did back then. But I remember living here <clears throat> during the Depression years when one year was so hot that you couldn't hardly walk barefooted. The ground was too hot. It was awful dry. I was about four probably, or no, about five when we lived. It was when we moved back here. My father's friend was Valera Taylor. 
<clears throat> and we didn't see each other except at school because she lived over on Fly Creek. We'd what? have softball games. The whole community had come. <clears throat> And there by Clyde was a big old field, great big old field, and the whole country would come and we'd choose to have two people as leaders, and they'd choose. And, of course, they'd start out with the big people and get down to us kids, <laughs> and we'd all get a turn to play. It was a good community thing to have those softball games on Sunday afternoons. What were some of your other routines on a Sunday? Go to church at Clyde. The little church there at Clyde was where I went to, to Sunday school. Annie Yates used to get up, <clears throat> like in the wintertime, she'd get up early and build a fire in her house and then get up and go across the street and build one in the church so it would be warm when everybody came. Uh, Shaker Yates's mercantile store and the post office was in one corner of it. When you first went in, there was the post office, and that was a. And they had horseshoe games going out on at the side of it all about all summer, and I could pitch horseshoes too. I was a pretty good pitcher then, and I'd get to pitch horseshoes with the guys. One day, Mother was out of thread and Dad was gone. We only had one vehicle, of course. He'd gone to work and Mom needed some thread. And we lived about a mile and a half on past Clyde, out in the country a little ways. And she let me ride on a big old plow horse and go get her some thread at the Mercantile. And of course, somebody had to help me get back on the horse. <laughs> somebody helped me. And I, and I didn't have a saddle. She just put a blanket on it and a halter. And I didn't have any trouble. I rode it all the time around the place there. So that was one errand that I enjoyed doing would go to the store. Well, it was a visiting time too. You'd talk to everybody you knew there. And I got to play a game or two of horseshoes before I started home. Sometimes I'd walk to get errands, but that time, one time, for some reason, Mom let me ride the horse. Yeah. Dominoes and checkers was a big thing. In the evenings, they'd enjoy that and play with us kids or neighbors would come or somebody would come, they'd have a domino game. Pitch horseshoes in the summer when it was pretty, always, everybody had their horseshoe pitching place already fixed and your horseshoes ready to go. We had kerosene lamps that we'd light in the evening. We'd have one going in the kitchen and <clears throat> or two and two in the living room maybe and you'd carry one upstairs to your bedroom or to your bedroom. You got to take a lantern or lamp with you while you were getting ready for bed or doing your bath in the kitchen in a tub. That's what we used cooked with, we were really going good when we got a kerosene stove to use instead of the wood cook stove. And that stuff smells bad, kerosene stove. But that was, we used that for a while and thought it was a real improvement. And then we finally got electricity. That was a wonderful day when they strung those wires up and you saw it coming across the holler and you knew it was coming to you. Yeah, I can remember the first electricity. And Dad had, a, well, Dad always had a radio, battery operated, powered. Just an old wooden cased radio and with the battery. Big old car battery is what he used on it. So we'd have music and Grand Ole Opry, we'd listen to that and good programs on the, whatever they had on radio, which wasn't much. Our very first school bus wasn't yellow. It wasn't even painted. It was it was a built onto the back of a pickup, a big pickup. It would hold probably 30 kids, and we'd get to use it when we went to ball games or something. It, and it run a little route too, down the country. 
I can't remember who the bus driver was, so I won't try to guess. I'd probably get it wrong. But it was, had seats built on the, around it, on the sides and across the front. And it would be packed full of kids. Some would sit on the floor. Wouldn't do anything to get to go to that ball game. And anybody that had cars, like the postmaster and the storekeepers, they'd have a car and they'd take a, take their, a load of kids to the tournament. But that was our first bus, and it was not yellow. <laughs>